With the recent Supreme Court case in 2022 overturning Roe v. Wade, the abortion debate has again become a major hot topic in American politics. It's an argument that's, unsurprisingly, long-lived. From modern movies such as Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, to even as far back as 1916, arguments have bled into the arts, and the entertainment industry has always felt that they have something to add to the conversation. Albeit, this is sometimes from a very different perspective, as driven by social climates of the time. Now, before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. My role here is not to inform on my opinion one way or the other. It's not because I'm scared of walking on eggshells. I wouldn't be shooting my opinion out to the internet regularly if I were. Rather, my goal here is to speak on the 1916 zeitgeist and the influencing factors and how they were captured within this film. Whether you think Where Are My Children makes poignant points or is just nonsense anti-abortion propaganda, that's also worthy of a debate in its own right, but it's not one we're going to have here at this time. But what the film does undoubtedly do is give us a point of view into the conversation and where it sat in the early 1900s. The film is inspired by the obscenity case against Margaret Sanger. Sanger is often credited as one of the earliest advocates for birth control and sex education and founder of some of the first birth control clinics, which would evolve into modern-day Planned Parenthood. There's a lot to get into for her history, and I won't claim to be some sort of historian in the field of women's rights. But to simplify, in 1916, the very same year as this film was released, Sanger would open her first clinic. Nine days later, she would be arrested. After being released on bail, she would continue distributing contraceptives against New York state law at that time, leading to her conviction and sentencing of 30 days in a workhouse. Her arrest would spark a birth control movement in the country and widespread debate on its merits and moral implications. It's a testament to the speed of film production during the silent era that the movie could take current events and put out a film capitalizing on them in the same year. It is often cited as one of director Lewis Weber's most prolific social commentaries in a long library. While the film is often known for its firm stance against abortion, it surprisingly takes a more pragmatic look at birth control in general, and a highly critical look at how the rich can make use of illegal practices unavailable to the poor. Most modern analysis tends to take issue with the depiction of abortion as harmful both physically and mentally, while others may cite the practice as accurately risky in the context of 1916 medicine where the practice was still illegal and secretive. I'm not a doctor either way, so don't expect me to tell you the answer. Maybe some medical historian down below will sort it out and leave it in the comments, but I leave it to them. The odd thing about the entire film is just by making it based on the controversy, the movie inserted itself and became part of that conversation. Portrayal of sex or sex-related topics was still very taboo for this time. As a result, four screenwriters are credited. Lucy Patton, Franklin Hall, Lewis Weber, and Philip Smalley. No director is credited at all, so as to avoid political backlash or reprisals from activists or religious communities or just state laws in general. However, most believe Weber to be the true director of this film, though many have pointed to Smalley as also being a potential as well. It is likely that it's a combination of the two, though, and I found a lot of sources crediting both Weber and Smalley jointly. Just getting permission to exhibit the film was a major hurdle, and the film came with an opening warning that only adults should be admitted, and children only with direct supervision. Essentially, those are the terms you'd see for like a rated R movie, before the MPAA or even the term rated R existed. Many states still banned it, but for those who did allow it to screen, it played to packed audiences and made Lewis Weber one of the biggest directors in the country. Let's dive into this thing. As a warning, this is going to be a spoiler discussion. The plot follows Richard Walton, played by Tyrone Powers Sr., a district attorney who recently had been prosecuting cases similar to Margaret Sanger's, notably a medical practitioner distributing a book about birth control. The doctor on the stand makes his best case. A flashback scene depicts what can happen to unwanted children or children with parents unable to care for them. Some of this you'll find is pretty on point to modern arguments, with children being exposed to bad households or single mothers unable to care for them or uh, parents committing suicide. It's visceral, but an honest take. The maker's actually giving the devil their due, at least in their perspective. But ultimately, the doctor is still convicted and sent off to prison. Little does D.A. Walton know that despite his attempts to have children, his wife really hasn't wanted them and has secretly been getting abortions for years. Now, the character of Edith was played by Tyrone Power's real-life wife at the time, Helen Rayum. Edith does not want children because she finds that they would probably intrude on her social life. She coordinates to help other women in her social circle get abortions as well, so they can continue to live a life of luxury without responsibility. 
In the course of the story, Richard and Edith take two new guests into their household, Edith's younger brother Roger and a new maid, Lillian. Roger is attracted to Lillian and ends up seducing her, I don't know, somehow, mostly by being a creep and as rapey as possible. And Lillian ends up getting pregnant. When Roger is informed of this, he fears the social ramifications and tells his sister everything that happened. Well, maybe not everything. That would... F too much information. TMI. That's what I'm looking for. Lillian is then forced to go get an abortion, and it all goes wrong. She makes it home in time to tell her mother what had happened before dying. This leads to Richard prosecuting the doctor who gave the failed abortion. But the doctor, he's got a trick up his own sleeve, and he tries to blackmail Edith into getting Richard to drop the case. When this fails, he exposes Edith and all her socialites for their illegal abortions through the years. As he's dragged off to jail, the doctor tells Richard that before he passes judgment on him, he should set his own house in order. Richard returns home and casts out the socialites, telling his own wife that he should be prosecuting her for manslaughter, which is kind of tactless and uh, pretty extreme. His final confrontation culminates in the title of the movie, the question, where are my children? In a final montage, we see Edith and Richard, their relationship broken as they grow old and lonely together. The scene cross-cuts images of them sitting together alone and unspeaking with images of them happy surrounded by their children that never existed. As you can tell, the movie is not subtle in its messaging. It deserves credits for giving birth control its fair shake in the opening scenes, especially given the time it was made, but most of its focus remains very fixed on abortion in particular, and it's trying to make the best case it can against it, which in 1916 may be perceived as preaching to the choir, a little literally in some ways. It leans heavily into the social taboos of the time, like having sex out of wedlock or abortions itself being perceived as murder. The film even goes so far as to depict the souls of children both leaving heaven only to be instantly returned and cursed. It's effective imagery given their primary audience in this era being mostly Christian. The combination of religious and moral iconography is not some weird coincidence, with many battle lines today still being fought between a mix of spiritual, philosophical, and moral mindsets. But what struck me the most while watching this movie was the sense of familiarity. The movie is now over 100 years old, and many of the arguments that the characters are making have not really changed at all during that time. Arguments of abortion being manslaughter or murder are pitted against the price of an unwanted child or a parent incapable of taking care of a child or even just the sacrificing the life you want for parenthood. The film is at its least accepting of this last argument with the socialites. It really depicts them as particularly selfish and amoral. A lot of modern stances would declare that they really shouldn't have those kids if they don't want them and that they need to be able to make that choice for themselves. But this is a stance that the movie stands pretty firmly against. Again, I'm not trying to argue it one way or the other for either side, but a lot of this story hinges on this perspective that the socialites are acting selfishly, choosing to end pregnancies even though they are rich, don't work, and they are in positions to easily care for children financially. Whether you accept the kind of honesty of this take will determine your perspective on if this movie is just interesting historical propaganda or a legitimate story worth telling. Either way, it does find ways to make kind of middle ground commentary relevant today. Regardless of legality, the rich will have access to what they want, while the poor are the ones that will have to deal with the consequences. This is an argument that the film very clearly makes, making it kind of this early example of this angry, eat-the-rich mentality. For me, though, the movie is still this fascinating time capsule, a look back at how a director and team of screenwriters handled a hot-button topical issue of the day, and how they tried to craft a story around a gut belief or feeling. I've always had respect for a story that had something to say, regardless of any agreement or disagreement I may have with it. It is certainly a film worth checking out, even if it may just make you a little depressed for how long the discussion has carried on, how little things have changed, and how no agreement is yet in sight. Those are just my thoughts on Where Are My Children. Be sure to come back for more historical film flashbacks and modern movies. We will be doing a lot more in the coming weeks. So keep those reels turning. Thank you very much.